This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Domestic Cookery Useful Recipes and Hints to Young Housekeepers by Elizabeth E. Lee. The Source of Liberal Deeds is Wise Economy. Section 17 Food for the Sick. Remarks on Preparing Food for the Sick Few young persons understand cooking for the sick. It is very important to know how to prepare their food in an inviting manner. Everything should be perfectly clean and nice. Avoid giving any invalid anything out of a cup that has been used before, even if it is medicine. It will not be so hard to take out of a clean cup. It is well to have a stand or small table by the bedside, that you can set anything on. A small silver strainer that will fit just over a tumbler or teacup is very useful to strain lemonade, panada, or herb tea. If you want anything to use through the night, you should prepare it, if possible, beforehand, as a person that is sick can sometimes fall asleep without knowing it, if the room is kept perfectly still. Boiled Custard Beat an egg with a heaped teaspoon full of sugar. Stir it into a teacup full of boiling milk, and stir till it is thick. Pour it in a bowl on a slice of toast cut up, and grate a little nutmeg over it. Panada Put some crackers, crusts of dry bread, or dried rusk, in a saucepan with cold water and a few raisins. After it has boiled half an hour, put in sugar, nutmeg, and half a glass of wine if the patient has no fever. If you have dried rusk, it is a quicker way to put the rusk in a bowl with some sugar and pour boiling water on it out of the tea kettle. If the patient can take nothing but liquids, this makes a good drink when strained. Egg Panada Boil a handful of good raisins in a quart of water. Toast a slice of bread and cut it up. Beat two eggs with a spoonful of sugar and mix it with the bread. When the raisins are done, pour them on the toast and eggs, stirring all the time. Season to your taste with wine, nutmeg, and butter. Oatmeal gruel. Mix two spoonfuls of oatmeal with as much water as will mix it easily, and stir it in a pint of boiling water in a saucepan until perfectly smooth. Let it boil a few minutes and season with sugar and nutmeg, and pour it out on a slice of bread, toasted and cut up or some dried rusk. If the patient should like them, you can put in a few raisins, stoned and cut up. This will keep a good day, and if nicely warmed over, is as good as when fresh. Corn Gruel Mix two spoonfuls of sifted corn meal in some water. Have a clean skillet with a pint of boiling water in it. Stir it in, and when done, season it with salt to your taste, or sugar if you prefer. Arrowroot. Moisten two teaspoonfuls of powdered arrowroot with water, and rub it smooth with a spoon. Then pour on half a pint of boiling water. Season it with lemon juice or wine and nutmeg. In cooking arrowroot for children, it is a very good way to make it very thick and thin it afterwards with milk. Sago. Wash the sago, allowing two tablespoonfuls to a quart of water, and soak it an hour. Boil it slowly till it thickens and sweeten with loaf sugar, and season it with wine or lemon juice. Tapioca Jelly Wash the tapioca well and let it soak for several hours in cold water. Put it in a saucepan with the same water and let it boil slowly till it is clear and thick. Then season it with wine and loaf sugar. The pearl tapioca will require less time to soak and no washing. Allow three tablespoonfuls of tapioca to a quart of water. Milk Porridge Put half a pint of milk and the same of water in a saucepan to boil. Mix two spoonfuls of wheat flour in milk till very smooth and stir in when it boils. Keep stirring it five minutes, when pour it in a bowl and season with salt. Barley Water Boil two tablespoonfuls of barley in a quart of water. It is a cooling drink in fevers. If the weather is cold, you can make a large quantity. 
Some boil whole raisins with barley. Take it with or without seasoning. To poach eggs. Put a pint of water in a clean skillet with a little butter and salt. When it boils, break two eggs in a plate and put them in. In about a minute, take them out on a plate in which there is a slice of bread toasted and buttered. This is a very delicate way of cooking eggs. Barley Panada Boil a small teacup of barley in water till it is soft, with a teacup of raisins. Put in nutmeg and sugar and break it into toast or dried rusk. Calf's Foot Blanc Mange Put a set of nicely clean feet in four quarts of water and let it boil more than halfway. Strain through a colander and when it is cold, scrape off all the fat and take out what settles at the bottom. Put it in a saucepan with a quart of new milk, sugar to your taste, lemon peel and juice, cinnamon or mace. Let it boil ten minutes and strain it. Wet your molds and when it is neatly cold put it in. When it is cold and stiff it can be turned out on a plate and eaten with or without cream. This is very nice for a sick person and is easily made. Cream Toast Cut a slice of stale bread and wet it with cream. Toast it slowly and butter it. This is very nice for an invalid and an agreeable change. Milk Toast, etc. Boil a teacup of milk and put it in a spoonful of butter. Toast the slice of bread and moisten it with water. Then pour on the boiling milk. This is very good for sick persons and can be eaten without much exertion. In making water toast, the butter should be melted in boiling water and put on while hot. To stew dried beef. Chip some beef very thin. Pour hot water on it and let it stand a minute or two, then drain it off. And stew it in a skillet with a little cream and butter. If it is preferred dry, it may be fried in butter alone. To stew ham, etc. Cut a slice of ham into small pieces and pour boiling water on it. Let it soak a few minutes to extract the salt and stew it in a little water. Just before it is done, put in some cream and parsley. If you boil ham that is uncooked, it should always be soaked in water a few minutes. To stew chickens or birds. When a sick person is tired of broiled chickens or birds, it is well to stew them for a change. The wing, with part of the breast of a chicken, will make a meal. Stew it in a little water and put in parsley, cream, pepper, and salt, just as it is done. Chicken water. If you have a small chicken, it will take half of it to make a pint of chicken water. Cut it up and put it up to a boil in a covered skillet with a quart of water. When it has boiled down to a pint, take it up and put in a little salt and slice of toasted bread. This is valuable in cases of dysentery and cholera morbus, particularly when made of old fowls. Beef Feet Soak the feet and have them nicely cleaned. Boil them slowly and take off the scum as it rises. When they are soft and tender, take them up and separate the bones from the glutinous part, which is a very nice for a sick person, and conveys nutriment in a form that will hardly disagree with the most delicate stomach that has been taken when nearly all other foods was rejected. A few drops of vinegar and a little salt renders it more palatable. Beef tea, etc. Take a piece of juicy beef without any fat, cut it in small pieces, bruise it till tender, and put it in a wide mouth bottle and cork it, tight. Put this in a pot of cold water, set it over the fire and let it boil an hour or more. When a person can take but a small quantity of nourishment, this is a very good. Mutton may be done in the same way. Mutton and veal broth. Boil a piece of mutton till it comes to pieces, then strain the broth and let it get cold, so that the fat will rise, which may be taken off. Then warm it and put in a little salt. Veal broth may be made in the same way and is more delicate for sick persons. Wine Whey Boil a pint of milk and put it in a glass of white wine. Set it over the fire till it just boils again, 
then set it off till the curd has settled, then strain it and sweeten to your taste. Renette Way Warm a pint of milk, but do not let it get too hot, or it will spoil the taste of the whey. Wash the salt from a piece of rennet, the size of a dollar, and put it in the milk. When it turns, take out the rennet, wash it, and put it in a cup of water, and it will do to use again to make whey. If you have rennet in a bottle of wine, two teaspoons of it will make a quart of whey, but if the person has a fever, it is best to make it without wine. Mulled Jelly Take a tablespoon of currant or grape jelly and beat with it a white of an egg and a little loaf sugar. Pour on it half a pint of boiling water and break in a piece of dry toast or two crackers. Mold Wine Beat together an egg, a glass of wine and a spoonful of sugar. Pour on it half a pint of hot water. Stir all the time to keep it from curdling and when you pour it in a tumbler grate a little nutmeg over it. Toast water. Cut pieces of bread very thin and toast dry, but do not let it burn. Put it in a pitcher and pour boiling water on it. Toast water will allay thirst better than almost anything else. If it is wanted to drink through the night, it should always be made early in the evening. Apple water, etc. Roast two apples, mash them, and pour a pint of water on them, or slice raw apples and pour wa boiling water on them tamarinds, currant or grape jelly, cranberries or dried fruit of any kind make a good drink. Coffee Sick persons should have their coffee made separate from the family, as standing in the tin pot spoils the flavor. Put two teaspoonfuls of ground coffee in a small mug and pour boiling water on it. Let it sit by the fire to settle and pour it off in a cup with sugar and cream. Care should be taken that there are no burnt grains. Chocolate To make a cup of chocolate, grate a large teaspoonful in a mug and pour a teacup of boiling water on it. Let it stand covered by the fire a few minutes, and when you can put in sugar and cream. Black tea Black tea is much more suitable than green for sick persons, as it does not affect the nerves. Pat a teaspoonful in a pot that will hold about two cups and pour boiling water on it. Let it set by the fire to draw five or ten minutes. Rye Mush This is a nourishing and light diet for the sick and is by some preferred to mush made out of Indian meal. Four large spoonfuls of rye flour, mixed smooth in a little water and stirred in a pint of boiling water. Let it boil twenty minutes, stirring frequently. Nervous persons who sleep badly rest much better after a supper of corn or rye mush than if they take tea or coffee. End of section 17. Food for the Sick. Today's reading by Chris V. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. Domestic Cookery, Useful Recipes, and Hints to Young Housekeepers by Elizabeth E. Lee. Section 18. Domestics. Hints on the management of domestics, etc. Some families are always changing their domestics, and weary their friends with complaints of those they have, and inquiries for others. Deliberate before you make a change. If servants are honest, speak the truth, and have an obliging disposition. It is better to bear with a few defects than to discharge them, these are qualifications for the foundation of a good servant, and some of the most valuable I have had were such as could hardly be put up with at first. By being patient and speaking to them in a kind manner, they become attached, and fearful of doing anything to offend. When they break anything, or an accident occurs, 
accustom them to inform you of it immediately. Few mistresses, of well-regulated minds, will be offended when openly told of accidents, but if they are left to be found out, you always feel more disposed to blame and reprove them. By speaking to them in a mild and forgiving manner, careless servants will become more careful. A considerate mistress may, without loss of dignity, make them feel that she regards it as her duty to be their friend, and that she feels herself under an obligation to advise them, in difficulties, and promote their comfort. We should reflect that theirs is a life of servitude, and if they overexert themselves, or are too much exposed in early life, it will bring on disease that will shorten their days, or render old age a burden. Some young persons are too indolent to wait on themselves, and ring for the servants on the most trifling occasions, when, if they were accustomed to perform these little offices, their health would be much better, and we should not hear of so many complaints, the result of want of exercise. All female servants should have time to attend to their clothing. Many have to work so hard through the day that their only leisure is at night, and then they hurry over their things in a careless manner. Where your circumstances permit, a good manservant is a valuable acquisition, and they are sometimes more easily governed than females. If mistresses were better informed, they would not complain so much of the ignorance and awkwardness of their domestics. Always give them their orders in time. If a new dish is to be cooked, superintend its preparation yourself. If you are capable of directing, a cook will soon learn to do without your constant attention. If they are slow in their movements, insist on their beginning early to prepare a meal, so that there will be time sufficient for everything to be done properly. If you expect company, have everything prepared that can be done with safety the day previous. In summer there are but few things that can be done without risk of spoiling, a ham or tongue may be washed ready to boil, casters and salt-stands put in order, and pastry or dessert prepared, that will not spoil by being kept a day. In winter many things can be kept for days in a state of preparation for cooking, and it greatly assists the work of the family to have everything done beforehand. Do with as few domestics as possible. Assist with the work yourself, rather than keep one too many. Those that take orphan children to bring up are often rewarded for their trouble, as sometimes a girl of fifteen will be more useful than one much older, and where a family is small it does very well. But in large families a little girl is so often called from her work that it has a tendency to unsettle and make her careless. Never allow your children to call on or interrupt servants when at their work or meals, or do anything which a child could do for itself. Children that treat domestics with respect will generally find them willing to render any assistance in their power. I have known a few housekeepers who have kept the same servants for years, who have assisted in rearing the children until they almost viewed them as their own, and these were not faultless. If they had been discharged for trifles, they might have wandered from one family to another, without being attached to any, until they became so indifferent as not to be worthy of employ. But by the kindness and patience of their employer, they became so grateful and attached, as to be a treasure to her family. When they become weary of such constant servitude, would it not be better, instead of discharging, to give them time for rest and recreation in visiting their friends. I have known them to return, renewed in health and spirits. Encourage them to lay by as much of their wages as they can possibly spare, in such institutions as are thought the most safe, that they may have something to look to in case of sickness, or any event which would require its use. Promote their reading in such books as are suited to their capacities. They sometimes have a little leisure, that could be well filled up in this way. 
I have found it to increase the happiness of those under my care, to encourage a fondness for reading and improving their minds. It tends to keep them from unprofitable company and too much visiting, to which so many are addicted. Young girls should make and mend their own clothes, and keep them in good order, and they should be taught to knit. The material of which stockings are composed costs but little, and they wear much better than those that are bought. Knitting fills up leisure moments, and promotes industrious habits, and when age comes on they will have a resource, although it appears so simple, yet if it is not learned while young it is hard to acquire when old. When servants are guilty of faults that cannot be looked over, instead of publicly reproving them, take an opportunity, when alone, and talk coolly, tell them of your sorrow at being obliged to notice their conduct, encourage them to pursue a different course, and that you will forgive them if they will strive to do better. I have known them much improved by this mode of treatment. By inspecting every department, not only will waste be prevented, but dishonesty. In cities many persons find it necessary to lock up nearly everything, and it is a lamentable state of things that so few are to be trusted. Sometimes treating servants with confidence will have a good effect, but let them be aware that you have a knowledge of everything that is going on. Some young persons are completely at the mercy of their domestics. I have known great uneasiness to be experienced, and much loss, but by showing a little moral courage, and discharging those that are irreclaimable, an ascendancy was gained. Never suffer them to treat you with disrespect or impertinence. If it is known that they will be discharged for these faults, they will be on their guard." If you have taken a boy or girl to bring up as a domestic, endeavour to teach them at least to spell and read. They are sometimes very fond of their books, and if you once get them to reading, it will become to them a favourite evening amusement. I have known them to take up their books on every occasion of leisure. I have seen boys that worked hard through the day spend all the evening with their books, slate, and occasionally a little writing." Sometimes I have in the evening felt fatigued and listless, and would much rather read and amuse myself than go out to teach two or three in the kitchen. But in attending to this, which I consider a duty, have felt a sweet reward. Indeed, their grateful thanks expressed by words have encouraged me to keep on. I have thought a little instruction in this way arouses their faculties, and tends to make them more industrious. When I have been prevented from teaching them for some time, by indisposition or other causes, I have observed that they were not so cheerful in the performance of their work. If they are reading anything they do not fully understand, take a little time to explain it to them. It will be, my young friends, like sowing the good seed, and you, as well as they, will receive the reward." I wish to encourage you in the most affectionate manner to attend to this duty. You will find it will strengthen you in the performance of others. The more we exert our faculties, the more we can accomplish. He that does nothing renders himself incapable of doing anything. While we are executing one work, we are preparing ourselves to undertake another. End of section 18 Domestics. Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 15th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marlo Diane Forbidden Dragon dot blogspot dot com Domestic Cookery Useful Recipes and Hints to Young Housekeepers 
by Elizabeth E. Lee. Section 19. Remarks. Remarks on carving, etc. I do not think it necessary to say much on the subject of carving, as those who are accustomed to sit at a well-ordered table and who observe the manner of the host and hostess can soon acquire the art both of carving and helping with ease, and when placed at the head of their own table, the knowledge thus gained will be found a great assistance. The proper time for children to acquire good habits at meals is not when there is company. It should be an everyday lesson, as when parents are engaged with their friends or guests, they have no time to devote to the manners of their children, and to reprove them at table is very unpleasant as well as mortifying. Young children will soon acquire the manner of sitting quietly till they are helped, if they are made to understand that they will not be permitted to eat with their parents and friends, unless they behave with propriety. I have thought it a great assistance to the good order of a large family for every member to be punctual in their attendance at meals, and all to sit down together, with a short pause before the carving and helping commences. In these moments of quiet, the heart is sometimes awakened to a feeling of gratitude to the almighty dispenser of our blessings. At the table, different members of the family meet, and where affection and kindness, those aids to true politeness preside, it is truly a delightful treat to be the guest of such a family. Every symptom of selfishness should be discouraged, for if suffered to take root in a child, it lays the foundation of much that is disagreeable to themselves and others. Inculcate this excellent rule of doing on to others what you wish others to do on to you, and always preferring others to yourself. It is the custom in some well-regulated families to permit the younger members as they arrive at a suitable age, to take turns in presiding, not only at breakfast and tea, but at the dinner-table. I have known quite young girls that have been taught in this way, carve a fowl or joint of meat with ease and grace. In helping they should be taught not to overload the plate, as it takes away the appetite of some persons to be helped too largely. The gravy should be stirred so that all may be helped alike and a small quantity put on meat or fowl, to which it belongs, and not on vegetables, unless it is particularly desired. If there should be a rare dish on the table, it is best to hand it around and let every one help himself, after it has been nicely cut up. Ham is much nicer to be cut in very thin slices, so is salt beef and tongue. Young housekeepers, in selecting their dishes for dinner, if they have not an experienced cook, should avoid those that are difficult to prepare. Never try a new dish when you expect company. Your guests will be more gratified with a neat and moderate table, with a few plain and well-cooked dishes, accompanied with a smiling countenance of the hostess, than with a great variety of ill-cooked and badly arranged viands. ECONOMY, THE SOURCE OF CHARITY If your circumstances will not admit the giving away much, you can, by economy, give a little, and a blessing will attend it. There are few of the very poor that know how to repair old clothing to advantage. A garment will be of much more service that is well mended before it is given to them. It has been remarked, that the poor are ungrateful, and forget the favors conferred upon them. I have seldom found them deficient in this respect, and when they are, if we would reflect, that if some of us receive no more than we deserve, we should be but poorly off. We know in our own families how acceptable is a nice present of something that a sick member can eat, and it is sometimes the means of restoring the appetite. When anything cooked in the house is rejected, the feeling of love with which it is presented, 
is a cordial to a sick person. How much more acceptable will something nourishing be to one oppressed with poverty as well as sickness? When the rich are diseased, the physician often finds it necessary to enjoin strict abstinence, but very different is it with the poor, who frequently suffer for want of nourishment. When the mother of a poor family is ill, how greatly are her sufferings augmented by the knowledge that her children are deprived of her services, and how acceptable to such a family would be a loaf of bread or a large bowl of soup which could be made of materials that would hardly be missed. Dried beans or peas and onions are a cheap and valuable addition to soup. Also, cold vegetables. The liquor that fresh meat is boiled in should be carefully saved for this purpose, if there are those near you that need it. It may seem at first troublesome to a young housekeeper to take the necessary care to save for the poor. It is certainly much easier to let the cook have her own way, and waste or not as she pleases. But for your encouragement, my young friends, permit me to say, you will be sweetly rewarded for your attention to them. One eminent for his charities, near the close of life, made this remark, When I spent, I lost, but what I gave away remains with me. To encourage children in acts of kindness to the aged and afflicted. Young children may early be taught to administer to the wants of the aged and infirm. Some mothers are in the practice of giving away a small sum of money to their children as a reward for some little service or piece of work that they have done, the money thus obtained to be laid out for a sick or old poor person. This method has an excellent effect on the minds of children. It incites them to industry, teaches self-denial, and the feeling of love and charity which are thus easily instilled into their tender minds make a lasting impression. If they spent their little fund in trifles for their own use, they would acquire a habit of selfishness, which, when once formed, it is most difficult to eradicate. I have remarked the pleasure with which children will relate the incidents of a visit which they have permitted to make to a poor family and it is a refreshment to persons advanced in life to see a young family thus trained. As soon as little girls can sew, they should be encouraged to make garments for the poor, or repair their own old ones as a present to a child of their own size, or make patchwork out of old dresses for a bed covering for poor people. Their being permitted to do these things should be a reward for good behavior and attention to their lessons or other duties. When they are old enough to make a loaf of bread, a pie, or a little plain cake, allow them to do it, and take as a present to, or make broth or panada for a sick person. This teaches them to prepare these things while young, and may be useful to them in after life. How cheering it must be to the aged or afflicted to see smiling young faces enter their dwellings, bearing their little offerings of food or clothing, the work of their own hands. Be encouraged, my dear young mothers. If you thus train your children to works of charity, you will be doubly blessed. Early rising promotes punctuality. It is an old and true saying that if you waste an hour in the morning, it is seldom recovered all day. This dispirits you, and the next day there is still something left undone. A late riser is rarely punctual in her engagements, and more of the happiness of married life depends on forming a habit of strict punctuality than young persons are generally aware of. If you are distressed at having required habits of late rising and want of punctuality, remember by perseverance they can be overcome. Fix an hour for rising 
and let nothing but illness prevent you being up at that time. While forming this useful habit, you should retire to rest early. Many things can be better attended to at an early than a late hour in the morning. Where families rise before the sun, the day seems much longer. All the active employments of the early riser are accomplished before her later neighbors have finished their breakfast. The duties of the bath and toilet being performed, her chamber well aired and arranged, and her parlor in order. She is ready for the more quiet employments of reading and sewing. In a well-regulated household, servants perform their duties with life and energy. Determine on an hour for your meals, and if all members of the family adhere to it, scrupulous exactness will soon be established. Hints to Young Wives The authoress is well aware of the difficulties which surround a young wife on her first setting out, particularly if situated at a distance from the kind mother who has hitherto directed her. With servants who watch every movement, and will soon discover whether the new mistress is qualified for the task she has undertaken. Accustom yourself to rise early. Fix a certain hour and let nothing but indisposition prevent your being up at that appointed time. By this means your affairs will all be arranged in good season, and you will have time for recreation in walking, riding, or in reading, such authors as will tend to your strength and improve your mind. Young persons removed from large families often suffer greatly from loneliness, whereas if they were occupied with household affairs, they would not feel so severely the absence of their husbands while attending to business. Be punctual to the hour that has been fixed on for your meals, and let good order prevail in every department of which you have the command. A mistress of a family is much happier who knows how everything is going on, from the garret to the cellar. By inspecting everything, you soon become interested, and we all know when that is the case, the most difficult pursuits become easy and pleasant. And with what pleasure will a young wife welcome her husband to his meals, when her conscience assures her that she has done her best? and that nothing is neglected, and how well it will lighten his labors to reflect, when absent, that the partner he has chosen is performing her duty at home. I am fully persuaded that the formation of domestic happiness is generally laid the first year of marriage. Therefore, my young friends, act well your part. If you desire to be treated with confidence, you must merit it. If you keep an exact account of all your expenses, there will be less danger of living beyond your income, of which there have been so many lamentable instances. Never buy anything, because it is recommended as being cheap. Many cheap things amount in time to a large sum. In selecting furniture, let utility, not fashion, govern your choice. Some young persons furnish their parlors so extravagantly that necessary and useful articles are neglected for want of means to purchase them. Be persuaded that happiness does not consist so much in having splendid furniture as in attending to the everyday comforts of those around you. If you marry without the useful knowledge necessary for governing your family, Lose no time in acquiring it. There is a time when most young girls show a fondness for domestic affairs before they are old enough to go into company, when it would be an agreeable change to be absent from school in assisting their mothers. The knowledge thus acquired would never be lost. Many a young man who commenced with fair prospects has been ruined through his wife's ignorance of domestic duties, and she has suffered from the constant diminution of his esteem and love. I once knew a lovely and accomplished young lady, accustomed to every indulgence, who on her marriage removed several hundred miles from her parents, 
to reside in the country, where servants were difficult to procure. This delicate and sensitive young creature was much distressed by her ignorance of almost everything connected with housekeeping, and after suffering repeated mortifications, concluded to learn to do the work herself, and when this dearly bought knowledge was acquired, she was able to teach her ignorant servants, and resolved, if she ever had daughters, to use every means in her power to teach them. When a prudent wife is made acquainted with the circumstances of her husband, she will endeavor strictly to keep within their bounds, always remembering that losses and events over which he has no control may occur and greatly reduce his income. And how will it assist her to bear a reverse of fortune if she has acted with no discretion? It will strengthen the wife to encourage and cheer her partner, and enable him to struggle through difficulties which were thought insurmountable. Happiness will not forsake such a family, though they lose almost everything. The peace which is the result of a good conscience will remain. This will strengthen them to begin anew, and the divine blessing will attend such efforts. A few remarks to encourage young housekeepers in their first attempts. As bread is the most important article of food, one of your first attempts should be to make a few loaves of good bread and rolls of the most simple kind. Bread rolls are very easily made. If you succeed tolerably, it will encourage you to try again. When you make cakes, begin with the simple kinds, plain jumbles or cakes that you can roll out, or crisp gingerbread. Sponge cake is easier than those that have butter in them. I have known young persons succeed very well with it. Bread rusk is also easily made, or a few plain pies. Do not trust the baking to an ignorant person, but superintend it yourself. Sometimes baking in a stove is protracted by the dampness of the wood. Before you bake, have dry wood prepared. Watch the time. It is a good plan to have a clock near the kitchen. Do not have too many things on hand at once, but perfect yourself in the knowledge of a few important dishes. If you make good yeast, you'll be more certain of good bread, light cakes and rolls. To cook a steak nicely is also important, and with a dish of potatoes well cooked, a dish of coleslaw and an apple pie or a little stewed fruit will make a good plain dinner. When your family is small, you can have something nice every day without cooking much. Veal cutlets and mutton chops are easy to cook and may be prepared in a short time. If you have a fowl and boil it, you can save the soup and warm it over for the next day. A cold roast fowl may be hashed. On days that you have cold meat, a batter pudding or plain rice pudding is easily prepared. If you wish to have an early breakfast, make every preparation that you can overnight. Set the table, have the relish cut, ready to cook or to warm over, and cold bread may be sliced and wrapped in a cloth to keep it moist. Coffee should be ground, and dry fuel and water at hand. With these preparations, breakfast may be ready in half an hour from the time the fire is made. If you have warm corn bread or rolls, it will require more time. But if you have them made up overnight and put in a cool place, they will not sour and can soon be baked. Maryland biscuit are very convenient, as they are always ready and will keep good a week. I have found it a great advantage to set the table overnight, particularly if you have a separate room to eat in. Although it takes but a short time, every minute is important in the morning. When the mistress washes the breakfast things and puts them in their proper places and counts the spoons and other articles, she can see when anything is missing. A mop is useful for glass and china. Keep a pan or a small tub for the purposes of holding the water, which should not be too hot. If tea things are put in very hot water, 
it'll be apt to crack them, or they will look smeared. Put a little soap in the water, wash the glass first, then the silver, then the cups and saucers, and lastly the plates and knives and forks. If spoons have been used with eggs, put them to soak immediately to prevent their turning dark. Have a common waiter for the pan to stand in, and on it drain your tea things. Spoons, when used with care, require polishing but seldom, as it wears the silver away. Dinner dishes should be washed first in moderately warm water and soap, rinsed in hot water, and drained before wiping. Put everything in its proper place, and inspect your pantry and cellar frequently. Sometimes things are forgotten, for want of attention, until they are spoiled. Air the cellar frequently. Do not let refuse vegetables accumulate, or anything that would be likely to cause sickness. You should provide coarse towels of different kinds, for china and glass, and for dinner dishes, also knife cloths. Have them marked and kept in their proper places. Some persons have their towels washed out every day, but it is better to save them for the weekly wash. If towels are thrown aside damp, they are liable to mildew. You should keep dusters of several kinds. Old silk handkerchiefs are best for highly polished furniture, or an old barrage veil answers a good purpose. For common purposes, a square of coarse muslin. Or check is suitable. You should keep one floor cloth for chambers, and one for the kitchen. Keep rooms for different purposes. Always use a soft one for carpets. As soon as they wear stiff, they will do for the kitchen or pavements. Pouring a little hot water on a broom softens it for carpets. You may save tea leaves to sprinkle over your carpet. When you give a thorough sweeping, this will brighten it, and occasionally to wipe it over with a cloth that has been wrung out of hot water cleanses it. Of course, this is only required for carpets in constant use. It is of great importance to health that sleeping apartments should be well aired and swept. If you sleep in an apartment where there has been a fire during the day, it should be well aired before going to bed. Or if the room is close, having a little air admitted so as not to blow on persons that are asleep. A window that will lower from the top is an advantage. Beds should be well aired before they are made. Take the clothes off and leave them at least an hour. In pleasant weather, you may keep your chamber windows hoisted for several hours, and even in cold weather, the windows may be kept up a short time. And if on any occasion you may be obliged to have the beds made without airing, turn the clothes halfway down and leave them for several hours. Some persons have cheap calico covers to spread over beds while the room is swept. This is a good plan on account of the dust. Bolster and pillow tucks wear better if you have a check case basted on. This should be changed, washed, and starched occasionally. It is a good plan also to have check covers for mattresses and feather beds, but the covers should not be kept on beds that are not in use, lest they should be liable to moth. In winter, a blanket should be put next to a bed that is not often slept in, or for a delicate person, and be particularly careful that sheets are dry before they are put away. In summer. It is most healthy to have your chamber floor bare, and have it washed occasionally. It is important to examine your clothes after they come from the wash, and see that they are perfectly dry before they are put away. End of section nineteen. Remarks. Recorded by Marlo Diane. March ten, two thousand and six, Piscid West, Prince Edward Island. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Domestic Cookery Useful Recipes and Hints to Young Housekeepers by Elizabeth E. Lee. Section 20 Cultivation of Flowers a few flowers and plants, when properly taken care of, are ornamental to the windows of a parlor or sitting room, and will repay the care that is bestowed upon them. Begin with a few that are easy to cultivate, and you will probably succeed. Persons that are fond of flowers and have collected a number are generally willing to give their young friends a few plants, and where we succeed in raising a fine plant from a slip or cutting, we value it more than one that has been purchased at a greenhouse. Geraniums, Cactus wax plants, cape and catalonian jasmines, and some others, are easily cultivated in a parlor. Roses, camellias, and azaleas bloom best in a moderate temperature, as the heat of a parlor, unless very large, dries the buds and prevents them coming to perfection. I have known these to bloom very beautifully in a room that was very slightly heated, either over one in which there was a fire or in an apartment next to a stove room. If the weather is very cold, they should be removed to a warmer room until it moderates. The windows that are open to the south are best. When the blossoms have matured, you can bring them to the parlor, but if there is much heat, they will not remain perfect so long as in a moderate room. Roses are sometimes troubled with insects, which should be brushed off with a feather and the plants washed with a decoction of tobacco not too strong. They will not bloom when thus infested. There is another insect which fastens itself to the bark of lemon trees and other plants. Frequent washing with soap suds and brushing the stems removes it, and sometimes wash the leaves with a sponge when the weather is too cold to put them out of doors. Setting them out in a warm rain, or watering them well all over the foliage, is very reviving to plants. Be careful to have pieces of old broken earthenware at the bottom of each pot to drain them, or the plants will not thrive. The earth should be sometimes removed, and an occasional repotting is an advantage, being careful not to disturb the roots. A mixture of charcoal and sand and rich earth of more than one kind is thought best. Earth fresh from the woods is good for pot plants as well as borders, but should always be mixed with a stronger soil. Roses that are planted round a house should have a deep, rich soil made for them, and they will then bloom beautifully all the season. Pot plants should in summer be placed in a situation where they wilt not be exposed to intense heat. Some persons place their pots in the earth on the north side of the house. Others keep them in a porch where they can get some sun. They require much more water in summer. The wax plant blooms beautifully in summer and should be kept in a sheltered situation, not exposed to the wind. It should have a strong frame of wood and wire to run on, well secured in a tub or box. Hyacinths and crocuses should be planted in pots, boxes, or small tubs, in rich earth, in October or November. A small painted tub is very suitable and will hold a dozen hyacinths and as many crocus roots. The most beautiful I ever saw in a window were planted in this way. By keeping some in the sun and others in the shade, you can have a succession of blooms. They are also very pretty in root glasses, but this plan will exhaust the roots. After blooming in the house, they should be planted in the garden. The same roots will not answer the next year for parlor culture. They increase very fast in the garden by proper care. There is something refining to the mind in the cultivation of flowers, either in a garden or in pots. Many hours that would be weary or lonely are thus pleasantly occupied, and the mind refreshed. I now take leave of the reader with a sincere desire that these remarks be made of use, and that the recipes which I have been at pains in compiling and arranging may be acceptable. End of section 20. Cultivation of Flowers. End of Domestic Cookery, Useful Recipes and Hints to Young Housekeepers by Elizabeth E. Lee